Hi everyone and thank you for joining me for some virtual vitamin Z as we bring the Detroit Zoo to you. My name is Claire, I'm a curator of education with the Detroit Zoological Society where we are celebrating and saving wildlife. So today I'm going to talk to you about one of my favorite species and working at a zoo I'm not sure if you're supposed to have a favorite species so we'll say this species is within like the top part of my top five. We're going to talk about Panamanian golden frogs. So let's check in on some vocabulary before we get started so you can see what words we're going to be talking about and then I'll use them in context and help explain what each one means. So today we're going to talk about endangered, we're going to talk about what it means to be an amphibian, we're going to cover metamorphosis, what an assurance population is, and what it means to be a bioindicator. So to start talking about Panamanian golden frogs, I probably need to take you to Panama. So here's my globe. Here we are up here in Michigan. We're gonna travel straight down to Panama, which is at the bottom of Central America. And this is actually a good example of why I use the globe instead of a two-dimensional map. When you see a flat map that's posted on a wall, sometimes the continents are off to the side just on how the map works out. But when you look at it in a globe, actuality, Panama is right below us and South America is just off to the east. So now that we know where the Panamanian golden frogs are from, let's get to meet them. This is a Panamanian golden frog. And you can see why I like them so much because they're a beautiful frog, that beautiful gold color with those black spots. And they're a national symbol in Panama, just like the bald eagle is here in the United States. In Panama, they're a symbol of good luck and good fortune. They're on their lottery tickets. They actually have a parade every August to celebrate them. So they're a big deal in Panama. Now the issue comes in is they're critically endangered. In fact, they've not seen a Panamanian golden frog in the wild since 2009. That means that all the Panamanian golden frogs left in the world live in human care. So this is their native habitat. This is where they used to live. In cloud forests in Panama, which are very wet, drippy forests that are warm, and they um, live near fast-moving streams and rivers and even waterfalls. So they have some neat adaptations to live in these areas. And as we go through those adaptations and through these different spaces, we'll talk about some of the other threats that face Panamanian golden frogs. So, they're frogs, which means they're amphibians, which means they go through metamorphosis, which is a big word for their life cycle. They start off as eggs, and here are some Panamanian golden frog eggs laid in a stream bed. Um, they lay about 200 to 600 eggs, the female does, and then the male fertilizes them. And after about nine days, they hatch into tadpoles. And tadpoles are the large, large larval stage of the metamorphosis. And here you can see some Panamanian golden frog tadpoles. They have that little tail. They have gills so they can breathe and live underwater. And then they start to grow back legs and then front legs. And those little tails start to tuck in. The gills disappear and they turn into juveniles who can live on land. And they breathe through their, through their lungs. So this is a juvenile. You can see just how tiny this frog is. If you look at the leaf around it, you can tell how zoomed in we are. So that's a pretty fantastic looking juvenile Panamanian golden frog. After about two years, they reach maturity. So here's a mature one. And I guess those, and again, those beautiful gold and black colors. Now, when they're mature, they're about two inches long. So they could about fit in the hand of an adult. So now that you're picturing a Panamanian golden frog in your palm, I want you to carefully put it down and know that one of the best things that you can do to help amphibians is to leave them where they are. One of the big reasons that Panamanian golden frogs are extinct in the wild is from the pet trade. Because they're so charismatic, they're beautiful and brightly colored, and they're a symbol of that good luck, the pet trade went out and people gathered up as many as they could find from the wild and sold them in that pet trade. So if you see an amphibian, leave it where it is. That's what it needs you to do. Now I have a really cool adaptation that I want to share with you, a behavioral adaptation that Panamanian golden frogs have. They live out near this fast moving water. So the, the water's moving and if you've ever been near a waterfall or a, a, a fast flowing stream, it's pretty loud. And while most frogs and toads call to each other, they sing songs and they make noises to attract the attention or tell somebody, hey, this is my territory, Panamanian golden frogs aren't very vocal. So instead, they rely on something else. They actually wave to each other. So the first time I pictured this, I thought for sure those Panamanian golden frogs would wave with the same enthusiasm that I have when I see a friend that I haven't seen in a while. So I pictured it going something like this. Fortunately, <laughs> I have a bunch of friends who are frog experts and they corrected me in my ways. And in actuality, a Panamanian golden frog wave looks something like this. 
right? And I hope somewhere out there somebody just waved back to me with a Panamanian golden frog wave. Okay, so we know the pet tree is affecting them, but they're also, most amphibians are what we call a bioindicator species. So I put together a little demonstration of what that means. So amphibians spend a lot of time in the water and they can take oxygen and water in and out of their bodies. So I set this up to show you what that would look like. So pretend this blue water is a clean pool, a perfect pool for an amphibian to go into. And this bottle is full of clear water right now, fresh, clean water, and I poke some holes into it. And that's to represent how the amphibians can move the water and oxygen through their skin. Now I submerged my amphibian into the water, just like it would if it was out in a river or a stream, and I'm moving it around just a little bit. And when I go to pull it up here, you can see that the water in the bottle is starting to turn blue. And that's what a bioindicator species does. It, it reacts very quickly to the elements in the environment that's around it. So if anything was going on with that water, it would absorb that into its skin and into its body quite quickly. And I actually put together another really short demonstration to show you what that looks like. So we had our clean water. Now, pretend that our water had some contaminants in it. And to demonstrate that, I just grabbed some black pepper out of my cupboard and I sprinkled it over my fresh water that's now contaminated and my amphibian model is still in there. That's that bottle that already has some of that blue water in it, right? I'm gonna put my amphibian back into that water. I'm gonna move the water around a little bit just so you can pretend like it's a Panamanian golden frog living in that fast moving stream. And things that humans do like development, building things or mining can create sediments and other contaminants that can make it into the streams that amphibians rely on. And if you look really carefully, you can start to see some of this pepper is actually moving around in this bottle. So again, amphibians react very quickly to things that happen in our environment. And if we're watching carefully, they can give us a good indication that there's something that might not be right and that we need to stop what we're doing and fix it. All right. So there's one other big thing that's affecting the Panamanian golden frog population, as well as other amphibians around the world. And it's a fungus called chytrid. The actual name is about 24 letters long, so we're gonna stick with the abbreviated version. Chytrid is a fungus that actually thickens the skin of amphibians. So imagine that bottle that I had dunked into the water. Now imagine if it was wrapped up in a towel, and if I was pushing it back in that water to, um, to try to get the oxygen and the water in and out it wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't be able to move that back and forth. So there are people all over the world who are working on how to mitigate the factors of chytrid and how to help protect amphibians from chytrid and to keep it from spreading. And we at the Detroit Zoo and the Detroit Zoological Society are a part of that. So this is a picture of the back of the National Amphibian Conservation Center. Um, guests might call it Amphibaville at the zoo. And if you've ever visited, you've seen a lot of amphibian species that up in the front where guests can see them. Behind the scenes are even more, including some of what we call assurance populations. And our population of Panamanian golden frogs that we care for are what's called an assurance population, meaning that all of them are in human care and we're assuring that there will be more of these for other generations to come in the hopes that someday we can reintroduce Panamanian golden frogs back to Panama. So these frogs receive excellent care by our animal care staff 365 days a year. We also work with a group in El Valle, Panama, who's doing a similar thing. They have these big shipping containers and they have them all set up full of tanks and care systems and they're caring for other species, including Panamanian golden frogs that live in Panama that aren't doing well in the wild or, or extinct in the wild like the Panamanian golden frogs are. So from time to time, we'll send down animal care staff, some of our experts to work with them on habitat creation and ensuring that they're um, they're doing some field work in the hopes that someday we can release them back out into Panama so they can live in those cloud forests and next to those streams like they used to. Now, as I was thinking about all of these different things that I wanted to share with you today, a couple words came to mind. When you're doing conservation, you have to be persistent. You have to keep going. There might be setbacks, but we keep working hard. Eventually, we'll get there. And we'll get to that vision, right? That long-term vision and goal of re-releasing them and reintroducing them back into their native habitat. So that's what inspired me for today's activity. And this is a pretty simple one that you can do at home. For it, you need some paper, um, a coloring utensil, so markers, crayons, colored pencils. It's just a regular pencil, some tape, and your hands. So today, we are going to make 
a thomatrope. And this is a neat toy. You may have seen these before. On one side, um, I drew a Panamanian golden frog. So I drew this really quick last night. And on the other side, I drew their native habitat in Panama. So you can see a fast moving stream here in the middle of the cloud forest. Now I taped these two pieces of paper back to back and then I put them on this pencil. And if I start to do it back and forth, you can see how they kind of turn into one image in your mind. Now that's called persistence of vision, which is a really neat trick that your mind does. So when you look at a picture, your brain keeps it for just a couple milliseconds longer than you think that it is. And when you start to put two pictures together really quick like that, your brain melds it into one picture, which is really neat. That's how early animation worked. Um, if you see all those little pictures on those film reels, and then they start to roll the reels really quick and put the projector up behind it, that's, that's the same concept. It's your persistence of vision that melds those all together. And I actually found a video online to inspire you on some other things that you could possibly make a thomatrope on. We have to zoom in on this one just a little bit. So these are some high school students in Marysville Middle School who were working on animations. Let's make this a little bit bigger and I'll zoom it up so you can see a little bit better. But you can see they have, they did theirs a little bit different. They had a cardboard disc um, and they put a picture on either side of it and then they just put um, string on either side and they can twist it back and forth. And again, it turns it into that little bit of animation that makes a thomatrope. So it's a pretty neat activity. If you make a thomatrope at home, I would love to see it. Either take a picture of both sides or if you can upload a video of it, a short video so I can see how your thomatrope works, I would love to comment back on you and give you props for making one. So we covered a lot of things today and I wanna go over those skills and concepts to make sure they're pulled out and really obvious. We talked about metamorphosis, which is the life cycle of amphibians. We talked about what it means to be a bioindicator. So those species that are quickly impacted by any changes that happen to their environment and how if we're paying attention, we can step in before things get bad and we have to step in in a more um, significant way. We talked about persistence of vision, the fact that your brain holds onto those pictures for just a second longer than you think and can meld them together into one big picture. And we practiced our fine motor skills in making our thomatropes and, and putting them together. So we talked about Panamanian golden frogs today. We went through their life cycle. We found out about the important work that the Detroit Zoological Society is doing to help reintroduce them hopefully someday to their home in Panama because they're very important to the Panamanian people who live with them. So thank you for joining me today. Um, next week, David will be back with storytelling on Tuesday and Friday at 4 p.m. And at 11 a.m. on Monday, my colleague Stephen will be back to share some more activities with you. Thanks for joining me and have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe and take care of each other.